so um, this is a story about the time I fell in love with the junkie rock star, but it is not about Courtney. So once I fell in love with this junkie rock star, um, I met him at the cat's cradle, like four cat's cradles ago. And um, when I sat down with him, he was kind of a dick. But then uh, he found out that I was in this band called Black Girls, and we'd been produced by one of his heroes, Joe Boy, this legendary guy. And then he just was like, oh my god, I have all your records. And um, I was impressed by that because he had vinyl that even I did not have. And, um, and we sat and talked for a long time, and then we exchanged numbers. And then began this really weird non-romance, non-relationship, where we would talk on the phone all the time like high schoolers. And you know, it's pre-cell phone, pre-internet. This phone is just a brick on the floor and you're tethered to it, pacing around with curly cord. And um, these phone calls were like two and three hours long and they were just kind of beautiful. Um, he would ask me about my parents, about my mother and my father and my life, and I was just like, yeah, the Holocaust organized crime and punk rock. Those are all my stories. And so um, he, uh, he had this beautiful, deep, rich voice, and uh, he thought I was really funny. And, um, and he said, I love your voice, and I'd love for us to sing together someday. So that someday came, and um, and we got together in this old studio that sadly is no longer in New York with Joe Boyd, who's the guy who, legendary dude. And um, my junkie rock star was so nervous, so nervous about playing with Joe that he came super high on dope to our recording session. And um, he couldn't sing or remember the words, and he was just freaking out. And I was just like, you're an important person. Why are you freaking out? But he was. So eventually, I went and stood in the recording booth with him, and then after that didn't work, we, we began to sing as a duet. And uh, I held the words on a piece of paper, and he read them. And, you know, this romance was just this sort of non-romance, this kind of out-of-body thing, and that was great for me because I had been in a very long, abusive relationship, and I'd been alone for a long time, but I didn't really want to be with anybody, and it was kind of amazing, because I wasn't with him, and yet we still had this kind of weird connection. Uh, but um, at the studio, after he finished not singing, and then singing, um, he just nodded out on the studio couch, smoking a cigarette, and he dropped a cigarette and set, set himself on fire. And so we put him out immediately, uh, but he was very, very embarrassed, and uh, he hurriedly left. And I, I never saw him again, um, but I did talk to him once on the phone, and it was our last talk, our last phone call, and it lasted until dawn. It was very different from our other phone calls because he was pretty sad, I think, and um, I was pretty sad. Um, and at the end of it, I was just weak. It was weak with longing and loneliness, and like a Victorian heroine, I took to my bed. And uh, I stayed there, and then on the third day, I rose. And, um, and I had like a progression of chords in my head that our old guitar player Pete Phillips and his soul rest in peace. We heard him strumming, but he had never actually written a song. And my subconscious had taken those chords and it wrote a song. And very kindly, it also wrote a melody, lyrics, a break, um, a chorus, and a piano part. So I was just like, thanks, subconscious. So, uh, so I walked into this room that was where my piano was. It was our dining room. My piano was the only thing in there. And, um, and I had painted it a blue called Monaco, which I was certain was probably somewhere in the Agia Sofia, though I'd never actually been there. And um, so in this blue room, I sat down at the piano, and the song came out just whole. And that's never happened to me before. I believe really that songs are kind of composite myths and that we don't really know their origin. 
but this one I think I do know. So uh, it's called Poison Arrow, and uh, it's for um, Mark Lanigan, who never heard it. Yeah. 